Good morning, everyone. Um, we do have the great pleasure to welcome on this very couch two literal brothers. Please join me in welcoming Taiwo and Kehinde Hassan. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Tosin. I grew up with twins. I'm godfather to twins, so I have to ask the ultimate twin question. Who is the older one? He is Tao. Yes, there's two, uh, two answers to that. In regular life, I'm older because I came out five minutes before him. In Nigeria, he's older because me coming out first means he told me to go look at the world. And I said it was okay because I started crying. That means I like it. And then he came out. Right. So, so, so the best way to that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, which I guess gets us right into um, one of our main topics here is um, home and origin mean very, very different things. We had a few people from Berlin already right now. You guys are living in Berlin here as well. Yeah. Yep. yeah. yeah. Almost um, two years now. Yeah, two years. Yeah. Almost. And I guess it's fair to say that you're part of a new Berlin that's not just gray and white and gray. <laughs> Yeah. In the literal sense and other senses, yeah. Yeah, Berlin is, um, for us, it was just a, a move to be somewhere that was just a little bit outside of the noise of Los Angeles and New York, which we still do most of our business, but it's just, Berlin is just quiet for us. Although it's not quiet, it's quiet for us. But, yeah. Yeah, come on. Compared to LA, where you have to be in bed by two later so you don't miss yoga class? Or... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> But LA is noisy in the sense of the business and yeah. what you have to take care of. Like, you have to really be super aware of what you're doing all the time. If you care to be in that world, do you have an Audi or do you have a Lamborghini? These are real things that you have to think of as an artist. I People, mean, it's, a Lambo is not a Lambo. There's, there's levels. <laughs> right. It's right. levels. Right, it's, it's got to be a Murcielago or a Galado. It depends what you have. But yeah, yeah here it's, you can indulge in that world as well, but you can also just walk down the street you can go to Burkine and chill, whatever yeah. you want. Yeah, which we like to indulge in at times. All right, very true. So you were born in Chicago, right? Yep, but raised in Nigeria. Moved back to, we moved to Lagos when we were four years old. Four to, I say Lagos is where we actually found the inspiration for music, really. So, yeah, but Chicago, yeah. I mean, there's a fair bit of music in both places. Uh, of course, <laughs> Just, of yeah, course. Yeah, same rhythm, well, different rhythm, but same creativity, inspiration. Um, speaking of Nigerian rhythms, because I guess to most Westerners, Nigeria is all about fella, I mm -hmm. guess, but um, there's a lot of other rhythms that are pretty big, so maybe let's have a little example here and you can tell us what's going on there. When, when you hire a DJ for your party, Nigerian party, that's what you play. You have to play that. You can play like all the Drakes later, but you got to play at least 30 records like that. Right. Then you know it's a real Nigerian party, you get sprayed with money. But we grew up knowing that as Fuji a bit, but it's, uh, they speak Yoruba, but it's a bit more, to me it's like an Arabic dialect it's of yeah. Yoruba. How important do you feel, because you're producing a lot of vocalists, and we get to that in a minute, yeah. uh, how do you, important do you feel that folks do actually understand what someone is saying? They don't. Like how, impo how important is it? Yeah. Uh, okay, so we had a conversation. Uh, he put me on to something a few days ago. Words are important, you know, but uh, feeling is way more important. He discovered with one of his friends that technically humans are not supposed to talk, really supposed to move with feelings. This is why you know how someone's feeling. If, even if they say something, you can see the feeling. So words are important, but the reason we can all feel music and connect is because that's how humans really talk, right? So words are important, but being humans, we can always see through the noise, which is the wrong words or the wrong message. You'll still see the feeling of that person. That's why you could like a Tupac where he's saying aggressive things and it's all, all the rappers that are talking about killing people or whatever, you can see the pain, you could, you could feel it. So the words are important, but uh, it's the rhythm and the feeling and the melody that's probably more important than anything. Like when we write, we go with melody first. Yeah. And then I read somewhere a few years ago, Kurt Cobain did the same thing. He didn't care about the words, he just liked the melodies first. And if you listen to like a lot of um, the songs he wrote, they penetrate more than just 
um, at the time, grunge, he just kind of wrote in a very human, soulful way. So if you take, if you change, it's the same tempo as R&B or gospel. So for us, the melody is first, and then you can go back and tweak the words for whatever you want it to mean. So yeah. At the same time, you got to produce people like King Push without the T, who uh, <laughs> is um, probably one of the most audible guys out and yeah. enunciated guys out there. Yeah. Like no matter where, you can always hear every single syllable, if not letter. Yeah, that's what he's about. Like, yeah, like Pusha's Pusha T. I don't know if y'all remember. He used to be part of the Clips. Him and his brother, they were like um, super lyricist in the world where back in 2003, where it was really just about tip drill with all that stuff Nelly had, which was dope. But you no, know, they they were penetrating with some real stuff, and it's, he's still doing the same thing now. It's crazy. It's um, it's a testament to. If you do have important words, how long it can live, but you know, outside of melodies, yeah, because yeah. he's not his melodies are very he's doing melodies, but it's just not as um, pronounced as a, like an R and B song or a pop song. So the words are more important in that scenario, I would say. But I guess before we get to Pusher, um, I would like to play a little something. Here's to. Christopher Wallace and a guy called Lamont Potter. Wow, but that's Junior Mafia. Yeah, get money. So I'll tell you two things about the serendipity and the album cover of Junior Mafia, mm. right? We'll get to that real quick. But so the guy that created that record, the production is a guy named Easy LP. He's responsible for us being music producers. You wouldn't know who we are if that guy didn't grab us up. So we were in college, junior year, we were those college kids that really, we knew we were gonna be big, but we didn't know what we were gonna do. Of course you did. Of course, we're Nigerians, you know? So, <laughs> um, somehow, some way, our beat, it wasn't even our demo. Some guys we demoed, we made beats for their album, and he heard it, and he said, yo, the raps are whack, but yo, those beats, we made those beats, you know? We were like 18 years old, you know? And he texted us on a two-way pager. Y'all yeah. remember what that is, a Motorola pager? We used to have two-way pagers back then. Um, and he but we, weren't, we didn't sell dope, it was just something you did. It was just a cool so thing to do. Just a little bit of status. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> college status, whatever. So he hit us up and we didn't believe it was him. Long story short, uh, he wanted us to work with him and be part of his production company. And he said, send me some beats, you know, let's figure something out. And the first beat we sent him is uh, Little Kim Get In Touch With Us on her album La Bella Mafia. That's our first platinum plaque at 18 years old. It's funny you say that. Um, can we quickly listen to or watch video number 10 for about 50 seconds or so? It's amazing. We love uh, Bollywood. That's great. So in Nigeria, we grew up uh, listening to Bolly, watching Bollywood movies. So all the family would sit around, be like 30, 40 of us in our uncles' mansions, and we would watch Bollywood movies for hours. And they, we didn't know what the hell they were saying. We just laughed. The music was so good. So I was dating someone at the time in college, uh, she was at a, she, she used to get her uh, eyebrows threaded. Mm -hmm. And we were sitting at the, uh, she made me go with her, like, yeah, just sit with me, I'm getting my eyebrows done. I'm like, whatever, man. So I, I go there and I hear this sample. I hear that, right, just a sample playing and all the women there are Indian. And I said, what's that record? Oh, I don't know, some movie. You can go next door, they have all these movies, CDs, you can buy soundtracks. I said, what? So I went and found out the movie's called Kasor. And we, you know, we didn't have any records placed back then. And uh, I, brought, I showed it to him, he was like, yo, we should do something with that. Chopped it up, looped it up, drummed on it, sent it out, Little Kim's record with Styles P. Well, maybe one quick yeah. hint of it, because we got tons of shit to go for. <laughs> It's kind of fun how you went from like Biggie to Junior Mafia to Lil' Kim. It just went on, that, and all yeah. this, it was all one camp in the end. Yep. And tell them about Chimo Du. And then we just became good friends with Chimo Du, who's the guy that did all the photos for Tupac, Biggie, and he did the Junior Mafia album cover that song is on. He just did an exhibition here like two months ago or something. But and you should look and him he's up. And he's Nigerian. And he's Igbo, he's Nigerian like us. Yeah, and we had a really good conversation yesterday about going back to Nigeria and doing all this stuff. So that's just dope. It's a good surprise. This is nice. <coughs> I was wondering, 
you had this hookup by this one guy, and I think it's a classic transition that a lot of people have to go through in their career, that someone gives them a leg up, gives them a break, and then at one stage you surpass them. And that somehow does weird things with the relationship at times. <laughs> we've surpassed exactly a lot of happened. people. Yeah. We've outlived a lot of people. Lord willing. Yeah. Um, but we've had, we had a moment after that, we moved to New York and we became bankers, doing investments with Chase Bank. So it, you know, we had a little short break. Yeah. But you know, we learned how to... We learned business. Stocks and yeah. investments and stuff. And you guys went to become investment bankers and then the, you stopped at a time which suggests that Lehman's was probably a good thing for you? <laughs> Lehman's? Yeah. Uh, you I got Lehman fired. Brothers? That's why I stopped. Um, oh. uh, when did we officially He actually stop? quit because of me. Uh, we were living in Atlanta. We had a house at 24 years old. I love saying that because that was funny to have that house. But we were part of the whole subprime, sub, subprime thing, right? So our interest rate was ridiculous. So it was you guys. Yes, we were part of it. We helped. Sorry. We weren't the bankers that. We weren't the bankers. We were the guys that, yeah, had the house. So I got fired from a job for not doing compliance things. I wasn't paying attention. But it was the best thing that happened. Because we got fired, because I got fired, he was like, all right, well, I shouldn't work at the bank either. We should figure something out. And then he made this song called Famous Girl. And then we moved back to New York. And then the next chapter started. Before we get there, yeah. seeing that you had your feet in both worlds, what is less realistic, billionaires or empire? Less realistic? Oh, the show. See, yeah. I, he doesn't watch Billions. You mean the show Billions? Yeah. He doesn't watch Empire it. Empire is not it. realistic. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> Billions is... I didn't, we didn't play on that level. We were doing annuities and um, home equity loans and small investments. But billions seems pretty accurate. Empire is, uh, to me, it's, I love everyone on the show because I know when they came up as uh, actors, but it's a, a non-African or African-Americans version of what African-Americans go through in the music industry. And then the guy that wrote the show sat in the car one day and he said, it was a guy, it was a producer, I forget his name. He came up with a show because he heard Jay-Z or something on the radio and he thought about the beef between the East and West Coast back in the day, like Puffy and Suge Knight, and he decided to write that show. So it's coming off a really messed up premise. So, yeah, it's not the real. show, the show for what it is, is dope for the actors, but for what it represents for our culture, is not good and it's not accurate. We're not going around shooting each other like that. It's crazy. Is, is it's Atlanta corny. doing a better job? Atlanta's doing a way better job for Atlanta sure. Atlanta is probably about seventy percent accurate. Especially yeah. living down there. I think the part about the kids running up on each other and the violent parts are a bit exaggerated. But but it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's there. It's pretty. I mean, Donald is from on. Stone Mountain. Yeah. And I used to work at a bank called SunTrust in Stone Mountain. So Stone Mountain, Georgia is a rough place. Some nice parts, but it's rough. So yeah, yeah it's pretty accurate. But you shouldn't watch television if you want to know what African Americans are going through. Just, just hang with one. Headlines. Just, yeah. Don't hang with one. We're not a museum. We're just, not a museum. Yeah, I'm just saying, like, be friends with all cultures. Just study. Turkish people, Kurdish people, everyone. Don't you want everybody. to learn about people, just study and read. And just don't watch TV. TV's entertainment. That's what it's for. Yeah. It's sensationalized. So, yeah. Getting the sensationalist stuff out of the way, can you tell us about that Nike story? Oh, the shoes. Wow. That's him. So... Growing up in Nigeria, two things we fantasize about. Name brand shoes, keyboards. We spoke keyboards into existence. We used to lie to our friends when we were nine years old in Nigeria that my father has a keyboard for us in America. And I remember it was Muiwa and Shegun. They, were, they lived next door. And they were like, yeah, right. Your father doesn't have that. You don't have money or whatever. So we get to America and oh, shit. Pops really got keyboards for us, and you know, he really got anything we want. We're like, oh, okay, this is great. Also, we didn't have name brand shoes, we had Payless. I don't know if you know what that is, but Payless is like the lower version of sneakers, so. It's worse than Woolworth. It's worse than Woolworth. You buy sneakers for like 20 bucks, whatever. We would paint Nike signs on them. So, in. That's, that's what Virgil does. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, you're right. Wow. It's, you're right. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> it's funny because we we know all his cousins because we're all from Chicago and we grew up with all his cousins. Anyway, different story. So when we were nine, ten, we really even now we know how to really draw well. That's why we design. And when I was nine, I really knew how to draw. Like, I can look at anything, draw it, look like an adult drew it. So my father used to get Time Magazine. Um, I can't believe he even know this. But my father used to get Time Magazine. Uh, and on the back, there was Air Max. Obviously, I was fascinated with the Nike sign like any design kid. So I traced the outline of the shoe. I remember it was Andre Agassi's shoe. It had like one... Yeah, it had one strap that went across, yeah, and it had holes. And I said, man, that's dope. I should just design that, make it a high top, put two straps across. Apparently, I learned last year that Nike never had a two-strap technology. I created that without even noticing it. That's why Jordan had the two-strap and the air raids. I was like, wow, that's crazy. So anyway, uh, designed them, looked on the back of a Nike box. I don't know where I got it from because we didn't own Nikes. Sent it to Portland. And they sent the letter back, two different letters for two different shoes I drew. And he said, oh, um, thank you for your submission. These are nice, but keep submitting. We don't need these. And they sent the shoe back. Then we were, at this point, we were in sixth grade. This girl named Kanisha was running around a few months later. She had these shoes on. And I was like, that look like the shoe I drew. That's kind of crazy. I said, where you get those shoes from? She said, where? Like, these are David Robinson shoes. I'm like, David Robinson? I made those. Of course, she didn't believe me, and I had to bring the picture to show them, like, look, this is my design. And, yeah, my pops didn't take it seriously, so that's that. Have we you been invited back to Beaverton in the meantime? No, no. we can't find that letter, that can't picture, find the letter, that drawing. Yeah. Yeah. And even if you did, they'll say they wouldn't, you know, statute of limitations. Right? I actually tried to have our lawyer go back, but there's a statute of <laughs> limitation on anything like that, but... Yeah, but I guess seeing where they are, especially this week, this is a perfect jump off for them to, you know, give you a consulting contract. The Kaepernick wow. stuff? There you go. <laughs> they need it, yeah. Uh, they're vulnerable. They're vulnerable, yeah. Yeah, you're uh, right. Not, not vulnerable, but I mean, it's like it would totally fit the narrative. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's Let's call someone after this. Yeah, make some yeah. calls. Um, <clears throat> speaking of calls, um, for the next one, you can choose whether you, because you briefly mentioned it, do you want to hear the audio or want to show people the video? The video. Oh, okay. Because there's a lot. There. Number one place, then. Of what? So, this is where the Christian Rich story becomes what it is. So, if you sleep in, wake up so you can know how to get rich, right? Seriously, that's how we met Pharrell. If you don't know that we know Pharrell, that's how we met him. They heard that song, they thought we were two white guys, and they were looking for us, because we're not in the, we're in the video, but you, we have masks on. So Pharrell and, and Shay from NERD sourced us out, found us, changed our lives. But before we get to that, but the song, I, so that song, I produced that, and I'm singing on it, I'm rapping on it, and uh, this is when we lived in Atlanta, and I was a banker, and we couldn't sell any beats. Like right. I couldn't say, and like a few years, like yeah. four years that's, maybe. That's like 10 years ago, right? This is 2006, this is like, 2007? Yeah, it's a long story. So this is when we went out on our own and we were not working ago. with Easy LP, so yeah. we couldn't sell any beats. Um, we lost the house because I had like a breakdown, or as Kanye would say, I had a breakthrough, so I just didn't want to work anymore. Okay. I just wanted to do music. So we, we left the house and moved to an apartment in Midtown Atlanta. And he went on a date or something with some girl, and I was just sitting in the house, and I'm like, okay, I need to figure something out. We're not selling beats. I need to just write. And I think I've been working on my vocals for a while. The original song doesn't have auto-tune. That version does. But I really thought myself how to sing listening to, like, NERD songs, Pharrell, and all that Dream. stuff. The Dream. Yeah. <laughs> and T-Pain. So right. that song came about, and then we kind of put a whole little mixtape together and sent it out around Chicago. And then we started to get a little buzz with our friends and other people. So then we moved back to, I decided we should move back to New York. And then when we moved to New York, we met these guys that did the video of BB Gun. They ended up doing a bunch of cool videos, Enrique Iglesias and some other people. But it all started from that video. So anyways, like he said, then we met Pharrell and those guys and then that chapter began. But we had a whole career as Christian Rich where I was just singing and rapping, and then when he felt like it, he would rap on some songs. Yeah. Okay. So that song, as soon as we did that song, 
<clears throat> we got a residency uh, at Webster Hall in New York. You guys remember uh, Webster Hall? They had a studio. I had a Christian Rich story. It's so crazy. That's the first time we started calling ourselves Christian Rich. We but didn't. Why? Uh, Would you pick the name again now? Yeah, uh, I don't know if I'm pick it now. We'd probably pick a Yoruba name. We're very, uh, we want things to be a bit more Nigerian these days. But the name's still great. Uh, but it was a styling company I was making. And I called it Christian Rich. And us being bankers, he said, I'm going to start an S-Corp, if you know what an S-Corp is. And he named it Christian Rich. As we get into the Christian Rich world, we started meeting everyone fast. Like we met Pharrell, started hanging out with them. That became even like now, like a nine year relationship, which is kind of weird at the same time. We met Diddy, like literally we recorded his album for like, uh, was it two months? No, two weeks? Yeah. We're working with him for like two weeks in his studio. Um, long story, Lupe Fiasco. We work with so many people. We're there. just in a very niche spot, the kind yeah. of music we make and the people we make it for. So it kind of put us in a nice, avant-garde kind of space, which is cool. Yeah. But if you approach it like an athlete, I mean, that's, that's you, you're getting blows at that stage, and how do you keep the strength to go like, okay, I had 10 almost and nothing got ever released, and... You got a bunch of stuff that's working too. Yeah. If you're really out there working, you got stuff that's working. At yeah. that time, we had, um, yeah. what, what did we have that? I think we had a, a J. Cole record, J. Cole and Ludacris were fighting over a record. That's another story. Two people that have somehow played a role in, in your trajectory were um, Pusha, who was mentioned before, yes. who has a bit of a Def Jam Love link up Pusha. as well, and John West. Oh, oh John yeah. West. Wow. That, um, I don't know this stuff. That story is crazy, crazy because we moved to LA, so I finally quit being a banker. He already got fired from the second banking job. That was the second one. Oh, I was like, got fired twice. That's yeah, right. yeah. I was working at Chase and then I quit in 2009. Did, went to Chicago for like a year, then moved to LA. Didn't even understand what a publishing deal was so much. And then we run into this guy named John West who's like a street performer. He just got a deal with Def Jam. And we uh, went to go meet his manager to do... Ben. Ben, yeah, ben to go ben. do a mixtape kind of thing for DC Shoes. We had like some type of deal with them. And he gives me this acapella, is like, can you, no, he gives me this song, and he's like, can you do something with this? I said, I think we can produce this song better. Take it home, had a session, produced it, put strings and all that stuff on it. So Shay's our manager, we're like, yo, can you get Pusha on here? I think Pusha would be good for this song. Tell him we'll pay him, excuse me, tell him we'll pay him, we'll have him pay him 10K or something like that. Pusha gives the verse the next day, and John West's publisher at the time, uh, is in the session, he's kind of being a dickhead. He's just kind of like, who are these guys? Uh, two weeks later, ben, the manager hooks us up. We end up becoming cool with his publisher, and then we sign with Warner Chapel, who is... So us signing with Warner Chapel is very important because that's how we got to work with Earl Sweatshirt. Right. And EP, his first and album. And Staples. And Vince Staples, because yeah. this A&R linked us with his A&R. So that's... The Pusher, John West thing is very important because we just moved to LA. We had some money from some other things we had before, but we were new in town and that literally set the trajectory to a whole different place, yeah. that song. Changed like, the brand, definitely yeah, changed the brand. Yeah, made, absolutely. It, we got a little bit closer to how we wanted the brand to look. Yeah. And yeah, why don't we take a quick look at video number three to see what that brand got to look and sound oh, wow. like as well. a video for this song. And oh, I meant Earl Sweatshirt. I don't mean this. <laughs> um, it probably that just didn't make sense with the, the theme. It's a bit kind of happy. You can tell the song is dark. Why that's significant? But that's significant because most of that was uh, produced by Chad Hugo of the Neptunes. So when we worked on um, Earl Sweatshirt's album, we were meant to just work on like two or three songs. And at the time, we were hanging out with the Neptunes a lot. So Chad was uh, someone we would actually hang out with a lot too. And when they asked us to do, I think like three or four days in the studio with Earl, he just got back from Samoa. His parents, his mom put him in this school because he was hanging out with Tyler. He was like doing that's a lot. Earl, not to chat, just to Yeah, Earl. Out. Yeah, Earl. I'm sorry, that's Earl. Earl. Excuse me. Earl was coming back from Samoa and was hanging out with Tyler, and his mom didn't like what they were doing. A bunch of. His mom is a scholar. People don't know that. His mom is a law attorney at UCLA. So he comes from like a really good home. 
So anyways, uh, he just got back and he was really trying to understand what's happening in music. They just got this crazy record deal at Sony. So I just felt that it made sense to have Chad Hugo of the Neptunes there because that's the sound. And you know, we don't mind working with um, other producers, if, especially if it's a friend. So the first session, I'm gonna make the story quick because it can be very long. The first session, there's a bunch of different people in there. Our early Vince Staples who didn't have a record deal, he was just Earl's friend that was there to just help with some vocabulary and stuff or whatever. Um, Corey Smith who ends up becoming Vince Staples manager and now is, um, what's the guy's name? Oh, Dave, Dave Chappelle. Chappelle's manager. And then um, Kenna and a bunch, it's a bunch of relationships started from that session that we did. And um, shit, I forgot where I was going with this. There's so many things. Oh, so Earl and then Chad. So we had Chad come down and then Chad brings like a thousand keyboards down because he's just ready to get into the zone. And we're working on the music and this song came about because Earl came up with the bass line and the piano and I started doing the drums and then we just started jamming out. And then his A&R came in like, yo, that's the first single. And I remember Chad started to play beats and he played a beat that sounded like, dropped it like it's hot. And I was just kind of like, eh, that's not what we're going for. And then he pulled me to the side like, Ty, I don't know what to get this kid. is. He's too monotone, he's too dark. And I was like, it's all good, just follow our lead. Because he's used to like, you know, Chad is used to super thug. Pop, pop artists. Really. You know, Britney Spears, stuff like yeah. that. And he's a real musician. He plays almost every instrument. He can learn an instrument like in a week. Chad is like next level genius. So I think by the time we got to the end of this song, Chum, that same session, he started to un kind of get in the groove. And then we were just jamming out. I, I was just pressing some chords on Logic. And then Chad started playing a lead on like a Moog or something. Trumpet, bass. And then he, he went in and went played in. the bass and yeah. then he played the trumpet off key and he just did all this stuff. And then I just kind of took it together and turned it into the outro. That outro. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's a very, that. And then uh, we got Pharrell and Chad together for the first time as producers and they did a song on that album called Burgundy. Yeah. Because of that. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that song itself is very vital to a lot of stuff. Now. Yeah. How did you manage that sonically? Because I mean, a, a big part of that song, outside of uh, Earl's performance, is that Humpty Dump drum break, and then oh, don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> we don't played that it. live in the studio. Yeah. <laughs> and then it goes into the, this <laughs> other drum. And yeah, uh, <laughs> I've been trying the, to hide the second half. For years. It's all good. I didn't, the the part with Chad like, is um, Earl that's Earl drums. playing around how we hated those drums because they're like Logic stock drums. And we're like, ah, let's change you that. You knew that? When you heard that, you knew those drums? There's only that many breaks, man. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, but yeah, but Earl, he just playing around and we wanted to replace the drums and he was just like, nah, like, let me leave it. But actually, we tried to put Tom York on this song. And he was like, nah, 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 it's too pop. I want to go dark. So it worked either way. But yeah, we just jamming. I'm not going to say what I'm thinking. I'm going to say. Nah, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 I'm no, messing no, with you. Go it ahead. Don't matter. Just you say, say whatever you want. Say There's whatever. no snapple, sample no, um, snitching. We're just sticking on the, uh, on, on the Earl thing because not only was it a, a pretty important tr um, changing moment, and not only is he a great radio host. Um, as some of you might have heard out there, but um, yeah. I guess there's a there's there's a lot of changes there going on at the same time, and um, maybe let's listen to a little bit of this. Thank you. <laughs> so Tell the story. that's another crazy story. So that was that was a session for the uh, Doris album, and um, his with RZA a, with RZA and his A and R, J R Lindsay asked us to. He was in New York, so he asked us to sit in on the session. So. Uh, Earl didn't really understand. He understood, but he, he really didn't know who RZA was. He had to ask his mom, like, what, what's the big deal about him? He knew who he was, but, like, why is he a big deal? Because I don't think he wants to show up. But anyways, he showed up. We get there. It's RZA and his crew. They got, like, a, a hella chicken wings and, um, like, Patron and all this stuff. And we're just talking for, like, six hours. No, like, four hours. And Vince Staples is in there, and he's telling the craziest stories about his hood, where he's from. That's something he would always do. So then we're playing them the album, what we did so far, and then RZA's just kind of like, yeah, okay, you don't need me for the album. Like, and you know, I charge too much. I think he charged a quarter of a million. And we were like, all right, whatever. So he leaves the room and he leaves this beat machine. It's like an MPC, but it's a Roland. 
And I'm like, yo, fuck this. We're going to get a beat out of this dude. So I just go through all his sample pads. And this guy has a video of this. Sony sent some documentary dude to tape all this. So I'm just going through all the banks. And then I finally find this loop. And then Earl is like, yo, let's use that one. So the way the beat, the way the sample stops, it stops. We didn't make it like that's just the way it stopped. Yeah, there was no more. So. And then Rizzo walks in the room and he's seen me touching his rolling and he's just looking at me. Like, what the hell are you doing? And then he, but then he hears what we're coming up with. He's like, actually, that's kind of dope. So Earl, actually, no, I asked, um, I asked Rizzo to give us like a five minute freestyle because I wanted with, him to with do the verse. Park mic. With the, 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 you know, the, what's it, the 150? Ever go yeah, the like the mic. shirt, like it's like a little outside basic mic. Basic mic. Like a preacher mic. And for some reason, he just got really amped, and then he just went in the studio and started rapping. It would sound like nonsense, but we turned. It's just funny. Rizzo was just talking that Bobby Digital shit. What's that? What's that? Um, what's that? Yeah, line? Bobby Digital. Oh, um, <laughs> he has this line that he says that's really funny. Yeah. Um, it ended up on another song that we did with those vocals, but yeah. it's boom, 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 something. Anyway, so then we took that, and Earl was like, "Okay, let's make that the hook." And then we chopped it up a certain way. So that's why... Um, that's why he's on the record. That's why he's on the song. Because he didn't want to be... He liked hanging out with us, but he didn't want to do a song. So I don't think he charged a quarter of a million because he said if he actually has to touch it and do the beat, then it's like a quarter of a million. So technically, we did the beat and just took the sample. So it worked out. We didn't charge a quarter of a million. But that's a funny story. As far as the content of what he's saying... Um, how much, how do you deal with um, providing a carpet and then, then people... <laughs> for for yeah. the, the type of lyrics they say? Yeah, it's like, I mean, yeah, I, I guess everyone heard what face. he was saying, but you strike me more like the, I want to count your freckles in the morning kind of guys, <laughs> rather than what he's saying. Who, us? Yeah. Um, <sighs> we, uh, Okay, so we're, we're, we have a lot of size to so us. So we're, we're kind of those kind of dudes. I mean, we yeah. really, we're from the hood. We're from Chicago. And we're from the hood in Nigeria. So yeah. we just, um, we kind of know how to navigate in the world, in the business world. So yeah. you can't show the fuck your freckles off the face guy. You can't show that yeah. to navigate in the world, really. Yeah. Not that you can't show it, it just makes it harder. But um, well, if you look at I would never, real quick, I would never tell a woman that. Right. I fuck the freckles off your face. I would never girl, say that. I would say girl or lady <laughs> or young lady. I'm not trying know? to fuck the freckles off no one's face. I'm really? just trying to have a good time. But you know, if you look at the artists we work with, uh, we don't really, we would work with everybody, but you know, when it comes to like uh, trap music, I would love to work with Migos and uh, Future and uh, what's that new kid? Skambo, Skambo, I think. But if you pay attention to the kind of hip hop we do, it's kind of like intellectual rap, but not purposely. I think the genius in Earl's is being able to take any subject and just turn it into this soliloquy of different, different um, angles of the same kind of subject. So Riz is talking about fucking a woman or whatever, but then Earl's talking about how he's fucking over the label. He gets to do whatever he wants, but he's talking about a girl. So. Right. His genius really comes in being able to see the 360 of one scenario. And he, you can see that through his whole career. It's like him. Uh, I think Earl Sweatshirt sees, uh, <clears throat> I think or Tebe sees lyrics. I think if, if language is linear, he sees it kind of like that movie Arrival. He sees it like it's all happening at the same time so he can see all the different parts. Yeah, the beginning and end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He knows the end result because he knows the middle because he knows the beginning. So you can attack it that way. Five points for metaphor there. There you go. Um, I'm good. Yeah, let's probably go back to safer, nerdy territory <laughs> and um, <laughs> keep it dirty. Keep it dirty. Keep it real. Well, we're bringing some cologne and some axelrod in here. Uh, same <laughs> album. That's Fun. nice. That's nice. That's um, the, tell the original version of that song. <laughs> Which one? Uh, Buddy and Snoop. Oh, that's one of those songs that somebody else picked first. Pharrell's artist, yeah. Buddy, he's a great, great artist now, but he picked that beat first. But I don't know what they did with it. It was him and Snoop, and that song was actually good, too. It was actually good, yeah. But um, I played like an early example of this beat to Earl, and he was just like, that's mine, I'm using it. So yeah. that was that. But that's uh, David Axelrod, Divine Image. We've had that sample 
since 2006, 2007, yeah. just trying to find what to do with it. So that, that landed in And David hands. Axelrod is actually the A&R, he's a jazz artist, experimental artist, but he's the A&R, yes. or was, he passed, God bless him. Um, we wanted to work with him. He actually was fair with the sample clearance a bit, but uh, he's the A&R at Atlantic who actually put Lou Rawls on. Columbia. No, it was Atlantic. Columbia. Columbia, whatever. One of those labels, but so his history goes deep to music, but then business side. So can you we like can him a you lot. find the intro and play the intro of that song? Not like the very beginning intro of. Um, you mean the Axelrod to Divine? Yeah, right. No, no, ours like the Centurion, not That's where right. Vince is uh, singing, rapping, but like it's a little bit after he does it. No, no, after oh, all. Yeah. Yeah. You guys hear that vocal that's screaming? That's the group Can. And that's from a 14 minute song, which I didn't mean to leave on there. It was just for effect. And his A&R made me leave it on there and they took half the publishing of the song. <laughs> just for, for that, that part. part. And but I think they charge a lot You too. talk about Nigeria, you don't fuck with Cologne. That's why I'm yeah. saying. Oh, yeah. are they from Cologne? Yeah. yeah. That was, that was worth it. That, I don't know if it was worth it, man. It was like, worth it. That, yeah. yeah. It's great. I like Can, they're dope, but man, that was kind of shady. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, that's how y'all get down to Cologne. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's how we do Shout out to there. Cologne. Mental note. <laughs> um, speaking of people you don't talk to anymore, because I was curious when I was going through these things, and you mentioned it earlier, wow. but somehow I figured that was more the reason, because... Yeah. Oh. What's that? I'm saying, what's the reason? No, we still talk. Because, uh -huh. no, I mean, that's, that's clearly a Pharrell... Starting no, oh, you mean for, uh, oh, no, he, uh, yeah, he loved us because I, I sounded like him vocally and yeah. the whole aesthetics was, was like out. from that. No, 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 no. Donald asked me for a Neptune yeah. beat and then I just did a Neptune beat for him. And then it's, if you ask me for a Neptune beat, I know how to do a Neptune beat. Yeah. Well, you so. can count to four. <laughs> right. Now, do you notice anything else in that beat? No, no, I think I want to talk about the same artist, but maybe a different beat. Lando Calrissian, everybody. Thank you. What'd you say? Uh, Lando Calrissian. Lando Courage? Yeah. Oh, Lando. Yeah. <laughs> Star Wars? <laughs> yeah, I forgot the name of that guy. Yeah, I know him as Donald, like, but Lando, Lando works too. Hmm. He's going to have his own movie, I heard. His own Lando movie. That's a crazy song. Yeah, but that's, so that's when Lando was still doing music then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, finding Charles Gambino was all his idea. Yeah, see, um, we were working on Earl's album, and a mutual friend told me that Donald is a big fan of Earl Sweatshirt. So we were doing a whole Soho House thing in West Hollywood, hanging out. And I saw him, or maybe the friend introduced us, I don't know. And I knew what to say to him to just try to work on his music. I knew he was working on some new music. I wasn't really into what he did before, but we're the type that if we don't like what you did before, we're gonna help you make it better. We're not gonna gossip and talk shit about you. We're just gonna help you make it better in our own way. So I told him, hey, we're working on Earl Sweatshirt's album. Come by the house and just come listen to it. And I didn't think he was gonna do it. Text me like a week later, brings his whole crew to come listen to it in my car. And I'm playing it for him, they're just like, okay. And then a week later, they were renting out um, Chris Bosch, who's an NBA player, renting out some house in Pacific Palisades. This house was like on a hill, it's crazy. And he invites us over, we're playing a bunch of beats, and then that beat stuck out. The original version didn't have that 808, because he actually went in and co-produced it with us later, added the 808 and the choir. But the beat was there, and the, vocal, the hook was there, this girl named Kai, who ended up doing some dope records with Diplo and um, Flume. Flume and some yeah. other people. The story how I got her vocals is like so crazy. Speaking of which, um, number eight, please, on the videos. Oh, shit. <laughs> wow. That was 2014. Every record we have has a crazy story. 2014, downtown Los Angeles. Uh, this one, we were still roommates. In my kitchen, our kitchen, laptop out listening to Travis Scott. I said, this kid has a great energy. That's what I was saying, humans move by feelings. I heard the feeling of his music and I said, I want to make a trap record and I made that. The original version had like uh, piano chords on there. And anytime we do beats, like I'll start a beat and I'll send it to him. So I, I told him, listen to this beat. And he heard all the chords and he was like, take the chords out, just put the boom, put, just leave the pianos like 
you know, staccato. And I was like, oh, that sounds great. We sent that to Pusha T. Long story, Pusha T was like, I don't want to do trap records. Before we even got a no from him, I already sent it to Vince Staples. His manager hit me back like 50 seconds later. Yo, got it. We're using it. Single. Thank you. Great. But that sample, that voice is a future. It was a reference. Uh, I just wanted to you know, say, let's do like an aggressive Atlanta kind of record. But I guess they heard it and said, no, nah, let's leave him on there. So um, Future's manager and Corey, who was Vince manager, they, Future didn't know who Vince was. He's like, who is this? You know, Why would I clear this? And he explained to him who he was and the trajectory and just the way the brand is. And they cleared it and Vince Staples' arrival. Really, and they were really playing that record without telling us they were about to put it out low key. It was hilarious. Uh, the first time we saw it was uh, South by Southwest. Mm -hmm. I just see all these kids going crazy online, and I'm like, "What song are they talking about?" And I play the video, and it's this song. But that was the beginning of, not really the beginning, but like for Vince, that was the beginning of us doing records that were monumental for him. The one we played before that was the first one you worked with Vince, right? Centurion? Yes, Centurion. Yeah. And yeah. then we had our song on our album called FW14 called High. That was really the first song that we did. And then Senior Rita. Just yeah. for context, FW14 would be? Uh, that was, that's our first solo LP that we put out with an indie label. And yeah, that came out 2015. And we had some gems on there. Pretty, pretty great records. So if you have time later, because, I mean, we have a, a bunch of shit to go through. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Check it out. SS14, FW14, great album. Is that like what fashion, fall, winter, or what is it? Yeah, people yeah. always like make yeah. fun of us and say Christian Rich sounds like a clothing brand, so we wanted to play on it. Yeah, we were like, okay, yeah. let's make seasons, right. <laughs> albums, you know. Yeah. 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 It's just a funny we thing. should have made merch. We didn't make merch, but it would have made sense. So. All right. Thank you. There's a bunch of things in there. Um, one of the curious things is probably before we get to the actual story that, that evolved around that and the sharks and that, but um, you are actually sampling an old Twin Staples track in there, sort of, right? No, you mean like... The North North bit? Nah, that's just him saying it. Yeah, yeah there's no samples in there. Okay, so he's just repeating an old line? and Yeah, he was repeating an old line, which okay. technically counts as a sample, but okay. no, no samples. Ah, all right. So what's the story with the video and all that that happened? Well, I actually don't know the story of the video. <laughs> no, 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 but um, the, the radio the thing, why it became so big like a year afterwards? Is that what happened? I guess so. We were here, so that'd yeah. be, oh, damn, okay. I can only guess, maybe Def Jam was like, okay, this is working, but, uh, okay, the day before uh, we moved, I, my brother was here in Berlin already like a week or two before me. So a week, uh, the day before we moved to Berlin, I made that song and I was in the studio with Vince. We had another track on the Big Fish album. And remember he had a board, I'm gonna tell you guys a really funny story. He had a, a board that said Big Fish Theory, and it was like all the tracks, and there's the said producer in the room that you guys all know, and they're arguing. And I'm arguing about tracks, and I'm just like, why am I here? Like, what do you, you know? He's like, yo, just let me play you the album. This is the album, I heard our other track, and I said, this is nice, but you need that big song. You know, you need something that's gonna make people say, yo, Vince, you know? I didn't have the track, but I said, listen, I'm gonna make you a song, it's gonna have a big feature on there, and it's gonna be a single, whatever, cool. I go home, I already had all my stuff packed, ready for Berlin, so I have my desktop out, make the beat real quick, I already had the Juicy J hook from something else. So we put that hook on there. I sent it to him, and I said, yo, can you fix this up before I send it out? So he did his thing to it, sent it out. Vince and his manager were calling me at the same time, again, within like 30 seconds and boom, single. But um, when we made that record with Vince, I was telling Vince, I, I don't want to get into this, but I was telling Vince about manifestation and um, I was telling him, let's manifest something. Like I thought of what it was and he was like, okay, okay, yo, let's manifest a hit. 
and you know, we made that record, whatever it is. So I can only guess that it got bigger outside of just the album because that's normally how record labels work. If a record's doing well and they see more traction than expected, then they go pay for radio. So that's probably what happened. But what was that story about the woman in LA calling the radio station about being offended by the lyrics and stuff? Oh, that was North North. Yeah. Oh, which is sampled, is it, is it yeah, or from which the, is the line that which is, is the repeated, line. yeah. Yes, yeah, probably what he, what oh, he was Oh, the lady, there was a lady that Christian was, lady. Yeah, she yeah. heard North North on the radio, yeah. and uh, she was offended because of the lyrics. He was like, you know, vulgar lyrics at the time. Actually, Vince doesn't curse anymore because of that woman. So yeah, he doesn't curse on Big Fish. There's no clean version. So yeah. she actually made an effect. So I think because that video went viral of this Christian woman going crazy over North North, it projected, it kind of boosted everything else for him. So maybe that's what you're referring to. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was just thinking because of the line that he repeats from that song and so on. Oh. But I mean, it's curious that you're saying that he doesn't cuss anymore. No, yeah. at least on that song. Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't heard him curse in any song. We have another song. Okay, no, no, he curses on that. He didn't curse on that song. <laughs> Never mind. All right, <laughs> so yeah. they're still cussing. <laughs> <Never went>. Yeah. <laughs> um, probably a little later, we could talk about the more details as he brought the session files. Yes, for big um, I know we're doing a little bit bad for time, so mm. um, make a pick. You want to talk Drake, Jay-Z, Wale, or Jaden Smith? What was the first name? Uh, Drake, Jay-Z, Palm Cake, Wale. Uh, Forget about maybe that. Maybe Jaden? Yeah. That's boring. Jayden. Let's talk about Jaden. Let's talk about Jaden, because that's cool. an interesting story. All right. Um, I guess we got a video for that one, too, yeah. right? Do we? Sure. So you're playing Monopoly a lot? <laughs> he is. I love sure. Monopoly. I that, used to. That song has a very funny origin. You can tell. Okay. That. So, Ghost, we produced that with uh, FNZ, who do a lot of stuff for ASAP Rocky, and HWLS. <laughs> that was a Red Bull session. We made that beat in, in LA. Yeah, in LA. Ironically. Yeah. Red Bull Studios. We just signed our publishing deals, and um, we hit up Red Bull and said we need to record and just produce with other producers and we did three tracks or four and that was the one that stuck out to me. So the way we do sessions, we we'll just if we're producing with other people or artists, it's kind of like we learned that from Pharrell. Um, you you create songs, right? Like if I'm in with Ariana Grande, we make five songs. Maybe she'll use two, then we have three. But we don't let them go to waste. So when we had this song, the track itself, it was either going to be pitched to you know, uh, uh, French Montana, ASAP Rocky, who we actually did pitch it to, or we're gonna keep it as artists. Folks might get a little confused because you talk a lot about the brand and the product and um, yeah. like the mercantile aspect of it, yeah. and think like, oh, hang on, do these guys think in spreadsheets? But I think there's aspects where it's pretty clear that you're not, because um, there's also outside of the designing, which is a totally different uh, ball game, another side to you, which is, I guess, the film things that you're trying to get into. And, um, and there you're making sure people don't forget about the people, the, the giants whose shoulders we stand on. And yeah. I hear there's a project about uh, Benjamin Wright Jr. somewhere in the works. About what? Benjamin Wright. Oh, yeah. no, it, it was in works. Mm. Yeah, it's before edit. Before we left LA, yeah. Um, I started to work with, um, I got introduced to Benjamin Wright, who's, uh, he's a string conductor. He's, um, he did Michael Jackson Rock With You and Don't Stop, and then he did all of Justin Timberlake stuff, except Cry Me a River, he did everything else. And the funny thing is his name is Benjamin Wright and he lives in a valley in LA, and we went to his house, and then this, um, She's Chinese, this Chinese African-American woman comes to the door. We're like, oh, we're at the wrong house. Looking for a white dude named Benjamin Wright. She's like, this is the house. Because <laughs> he's black, he's African-American. He's from Mississippi. He was able to dodge the Vietnam War in an unfortunate way. But his story is just crazy. No one knows who he is. He signed to Quincy Jones Publishing. And we just thought we should do a documentary on him. So we started Incredible. to put that together. We were working with... Um, What's that production company? God, what's that name? There's a production company. Oh, truly yours, yours Truly. Yours Truly. I don't know. Truly, yours Truly. Yeah. Yes. Really cool production company out of LA. 
But um, when I moved, I kind of started, moved to Berlin and kind of started doing other stuff. And I left other people to do that, and they ended up not doing it. They ended up kind of not Flash getting along. Yeah. yeah. So, so maybe we could revisit it. Yeah, but, but we're working uh, on an anime. We're actually now. working on an anime so that's the cartoon series. That's something we're doing for yeah, ourselves. Right. Thirty minute episode. And we're scoring the whole thing. Yeah. Right. What Everything goes back to us just doing the whole music. Yeah. <laughs> we just want to score it ourselves. Right. When is that gonna see the light of day? Hopefully well, two thousand twenty. I wouldn't yeah. say nineteen, two thousand twenty. But there'll be a trailer of sorts that kinda will be floating around end of this year, maybe. But yeah. You just mentioned another um, person you seem to be a fair, be doing a fair bit of work with, um, and also kind of a loop back to Chicago as well, and that's probably a nice way to end before we go to questions and maybe the, those session files. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Vic Mansa. Ah, yeah. uh, man, Vic. So, this generation of artists now, I can name 10 artists that were influenced by us without us even realizing it. Some of them know us personally. Chance the Rapper's whole, his visuals, the album cover all came from a kid that, okay, can I tell that story real quick? Then we can, you understand Vic, why I'm saying this? So, Go Link, SZA, Chance the Rapper, Vic Mensa, Vince Staples, all these people kind of link back to us, like like uh, inspiration wise. So Vic Mensa introduced Chance to our music. Vic has always been a fan, but we never met him. He's just, With his old group kids these days? Yeah, kids these days. So we just he's always like rooting for us when we were back in New York. So we had an album cover called The Decadence and the kid that drew it, I worked with him when we were 18, uh, when we did The Decadence, which was probably whatever, 15 years later. That album cover is what Chance saw and said, yo, I want the guy that drew that to do my artwork, which is now all his merch the acid rap cover, all of that. So Vic is responsible for kind of getting the kids, the youth in Chicago to understand who we were musically. Uh, so whenever we would meet Vic, um, it was always love. We worked on his first mixtape, the Inner, Inner Tape, I think it was called, um, before he had his big break. And we just he's always been like the, the little homie that's just always active with Chicago artists. And we have a new song called Dripping Summers with Little Dragon that um, he wanted to be on, so you know he's on that. So now we're kind of doing a bit more work together, but he's a dear friend and just fellow African. He's half Ghanaian, so it's always good to work with Vic. You know, there seems to be a bigger breed of artists in um, Chicago now than, let's say, bef uh, that have like a, a national and global role in the hip hop world way more than before good music existed, right? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Even before good music, I mean, Lupe Fiasco was big in the city. Like, he was, and before him was Twister, um, Crucial Conflict. Do or Die. Do or Die. Psychodrama. Yeah, but the, I those. think Lupe probably made the biggest impact because his music sounded more like what they were doing in the East Coast. So, yeah, yeah. definitely before good music. Good music is kind of like, that kind of made the city make sense musically. Yeah. It was a bit more organized. You can see yeah, label, okay. artist, artist, produce. like it was yeah. a structure. Before it was like really the West Side, now that I think about it. It's really the West Side of Chicago making all the yeah, music. Yeah, Twister, Do Adal, Crucial Conflict, all those guys are from the West Side. That's why the sound was like that. Lupe's from the West Side too. Right, Lupe, yeah. yeah. Shall we have a really quick listen for, to... For, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, who's the woman singing there? Yukimi from Little Dragon. Yeah. So yeah. that's a mildly different area to touch on than certain other areas that you played with before. Yeah, we've been trying to work with them for like five, six years. And we did a re our publisher hooked us up with their label at the time, and we did a remix for them. And then we just traded favors. We did a remix, we didn't charge them. We did a song, they didn't charge us. So, yeah, yeah. it's that simple. And they turned that in in like an hour. Once they were off tour or whatever, was this like three weeks ago? She gave us the song on Wednesday. No, yeah, Wednesday, and we put the song out on Thursday. Just <laughs> mixed it. Yeah. And Vic did his verse quickly and sent it. So, how's the process different when you have something like that in mind compared to, I don't know, getting something for Wale and? Uh, in what sense? Just like when when you produce the actual track. Mm-hmm. 
Well, the Wale song was a beat that we had around. It was a Christian Rich beat for our project. We had that beat around. That was actually the original beat. That beat was supposed to be on um, Earl Sweatshirt's album. The label really wanted him to use it. He didn't use it because it was too pop for him. And then somebody else picked A$AP it. A$AP Rocky and Swiss A$AP Beats. A$AP Rocky and Swiss Beats. They yeah, had a song to it that was crazy. I heard he played it for me. It was dope. Yeah. But, and Nicki Minaj um, was supposed to do it, but she didn't do it. So then we ended up, so, Wale ended up using it. Yeah, Wale um, was really ab- he was He really wanted to use it, so we let him use it. But... With Wale, it's it's us as producers, so it's a little different when you do that. But this is like our own song, so we're curating exactly who we want on that beat, how we want it to sound, and how we want the song to come out. So it's two different processes as far as the um, when it's our own project and when it's um, someone else's for their album. So just two different processes. Yeah, because you can tell it's like melodically and harmonically, it's a very different yeah. thing than. Than all the Earl stuff, for example. Yeah. yeah, I mean nowadays, I mean we've always been super into melodies and chords and all that, but we just happen to work with a lot of um, rappers, so it's been hard for people to know that we really get into all those dreamy places. So this song is nice to finally put out. Yes. Before we get to those session files, now what's the story with that thing on Instagram? That video. Oh, Will. Yeah. Uh, Smith. So that's why we were in Budapest for five days. Um, Will wanted us to come out to uh, record. We did a whole bunch of songs. Um, he was doing something out there, and obviously we went there for five he days. He talks about it. He's shooting a movie. He was shooting a movie. Yeah, he was shooting a movie, and we just got in the room, starstruck. That's why we starstruck for a few hours. Um, couldn't really work. He had to take over because it was kind of like he was treating us like his little brothers. So he was just telling us mad information, just super cool. And we used the information to make the song. So he was just like, I want to make new songs and I want this idea and that idea. And we just started feeding him beats and Will writes. Like he really writes. Like he just, he'll just sit down and be like, oh yeah, I got to rap to that. And he'll just go in, boom, got his song. And yeah, we just developed a relationship with him, and he was like, yo, I'm going to use one of these songs, and we didn't really get a warning. It was more like 10 seconds before you put on Instagram. Yeah, I'm putting this on Instagram. I'm going to add your name. But I kept egging him on to put that song out because he had a line in the song that said um, something about um, LeBron. LeBron leaving Miami. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, good line, though. And then once is. LeBron went to L.A., I was just like, yo, you should put that out and just say Cleveland instead of Miami. Miami, yeah. So... I wrote that one word, Cleveland. Do you get writer's credits for that? <laughs> yeah, we always get writer's always. credits. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, on, that, on his kind of, it sorts you out. But that, that song is dope just because um, it is the one song he actually sat down and wrote. He had it pre-written already, and yeah. he just knocked it out. And we weren't supposed to use the beat because it's just a loop, it's a sample. And we did like a bunch of other versions, really trapped out, but because he wanted something like Ghost, but he ended up going with that um, Gary Glitter vibe. Gary Glitter vibe, yeah. Yeah, it's the vibe, it's the, vibe, vibe. Gary Glitter vibe. G- Gary, Gl- y'all know who Gary Glitter is? Okay. Yeah, it's we're vibe. not. We're just gonna talk about the music with him. Right. Just leave it's it the there. Vibe. Uh-huh. Um, but how does that feel? I mean, it's like obviously Will was always in a very particular place in, in hip hop culture but a lot of our generation grew up listening to Summertime. Yeah. yeah At the same time, seeing him on TV, clowning. Yeah. yeah. And then like seeing him clowning on the big screen in right. blockbuster movies. Yeah. And then he tries to compete on a beat with his son. Like, <laughs> nah, he's, he can't compete with his son. He was the first rapper to ever win a Grammy. That's it. Yeah. And he boycotted a Grammy because they wouldn't show hip hop. Yeah. So. Well, speaking of young voices, uh, we do want to give the chance to all the young voices in the room um, to ask their questions and to look a little deeper um, into what, how you actually go about arranging these tracks and so on. But not before we take the chance and um, give these two guys a big hand of applause and thank them for sharing it. Thank you. Thank you. Just by the way, thank y'all for sitting here. Y'all look tired as fuck. Thank you for sitting through Hot this as whole fuck. rhetoric. Thank so you. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for not falling asleep. 
before we get to the really important business of lunch, questions. <laughs> <laughs> questions, questions. Do you love cheese? And I wanted to ask you guys a bit about, uh, you sort of briefly touched on a bit writing splits, about how you guys worked out with, like how you guys maybe wor worked out when you were coming up. Writing uh, splits? You, writing splits, yeah. Oh, like when on you're, the so, so yeah, when you're, cause obviously, yeah. like me, like the law, you know, it's like 50% lyrics, 50% melody, but I feel like that really doesn't reflect like what the way music is in 2018, cause production yeah. is such a huge part of like what a song is. So I was kind of wondering how you guys worked out and how you guys feel about that kind of. Um, as a producer, we kind of dictate the splits yeah. because they trust, everyone trusts that we um, know the writers and know who did what. So generally when we produce a, produce a song, we a lot of times don't write the words, we make the beat, but we share and the writers share and the publishing share. So we start off at 50% as a producer and then, then the other 50s reserved for writing. Right. And sometimes you work your way down because maybe there's four other writers on there and you want to be fair and you know give them some of your publishing and writing. But uh, generally speaking, yeah, 50% is yours as a producer. You don't have to give that up. It just makes your life easier if you're more lenient and share the publishing a bit. I heard that Kanye from my old publisher, he just likes to give everybody publishing. He doesn't care. And the publisher doesn't like that. But you can do whatever you want. Yeah, but he never, he never does the accounting, and that's one easy right. way to do it. Because he's super he in the creative that. space, so he just wants to give it away. But. Yeah. You always work it like when you started? 50. You always start at 50. From yeah. When you're like, yeah. You just, always start at 50, because it's just the old school thing we learned yeah. from working with EZLP and those guys. You just yeah. start at 50, then you go down. And if, if you it's write... another artist track. Like, What's that? For another artist track. Like for another artist track? Yeah, like an artist comes to you and says they want you to produce their track for them. Yeah, we're taking 50. Yeah, yeah. We just mm -hmm. did an album for this girl, Nilly I don't Adida. care if I put a snare, I'm taking 50. Yeah, well, it depends. <laughs> I mean, it's also... It depends. Know, it depends if you understand the mechanics of how that breaks down. We, we, we understand equations a bit with publishing and mechanical royalties, all that stuff. So you, for us, we kind of have the advantage. We know how the numbers should be and how we want it to look. So, yeah. Yeah. But all jokes aside, I mean, getting 50% is one thing, but if someone would actually never, or at least for years, do the accounting, then all you're sitting with is the advance you got, right? Nah, nah. nah. You do paperwork. You do a producer's... With, the, with thorough with this. You, do, um, you have to do a long sheet, or at least a short form. And the LOD, which is a yeah. letter of direction. So that's where they know to send the money to. Yeah. So if you're working on a record and you're not getting accounting statements, uh, in your agreement, a general producer agreement or a side artist agreement, there's a part in there that says we can go and look at your books. Yeah, you can look at anyone's so books. So if you go and someone's, you know, if you're not getting accounting sheets every quarter, which is four in a year, you have the right to go and say, okay, let me see your books. Yeah. And you don't have to forewarn them so they don't cook the books. So you could just be like, yo, I need to look at your books right now. My CPA is right here, and you can see if, if you've been getting paid or not. So. You got to finesse that in a good way, because if you start asking for accounting books and stuff, yeah. you could probably it, it can burn up. relationships. Yeah, <laughs> so you just have to be, be smart about it. Smart about how you <coughs> investigate your royalties, but you definitely have the right to look into all that contractually. Yeah, if you do the right contract. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably an interesting and valid point as well. Like legally, you do have the option, but it's the pretty nuclear solution. Like, yeah, there's a good exactly. chance you're not going to be working with those people no. for a long while. It depends how you know how much they want your art. If they like your yeah. music that much, yeah, yeah, doesn't matter. Just depends. If you make people hits and make them money, they have yeah, no choice. they don't care. <laughs> yeah, they'll figure it out. Great question, though. Yeah. I think she was having a question a long time. And he's, he's coming with the mic. Hello. Hi. Hello. First of all, thank, thanks for all the awesome stories. I mean, Glad they're really like good. They're welcome. timeless. So don't be afraid of just sharing them. So I have two questions. Well, I actually have like tons of questions, but let's just keep it two. OK, first one is about um, female vocals on rap tracks. So, how do you? Th what do you think about that? Well, I want to know what. How do you work with them? How do you know like that a female vocalist will work on a on a, a rap on a rap, and how does that 
How do you know it is going to work? And the second question is about trap music, because trap music right now is like, got to a point that is huge right now. So I want to know your opinion about uh, what do you think trap music is heading towards to? I mean, to us, Here's it's not question. rap music, it's just music. So we can put a vocalist on anything. Um, so that's the that's how we look at it. It's, it's just music. It's the same 12 notes. 12 Core skills. skills. Yeah, it's so. only so much, so many skills in music. So. so if you look at music just as that, let people pick the genre. You just make the music. Doesn't matter if it's a female or male, a rapper, a singer. As far as trap music, I mean, trap is not going to go anywhere because the trap is a real place. It's a crack house. So the idea of trap music will always be around. It's turning pop now because different genres are taking it, but trap is trap. That's not going anywhere. Trap has been around. That's a real situation. African Bombada yeah. and those guys created trap with the 808s and stuff. And then Atlanta took it and made it. They slowed Actually, it down New Orleans took it first and made Manny Fresh. Um, what's that style they got? Bounce music. Bounce, yeah. And then Atlanta and Miami, they kind of took it and made their own thing. So trap is black music that's not going anywhere. Black music doesn't go anywhere. So nah, it ain't going nowhere. It's, you're just going to hear new artists trying to interpret I would learn. I would so. learn how to use 808s because them shits right. ain't going nowhere. Yeah, so just know that. Yo, what's up, guys? Um, damn, damn, what's damn. Up, guys? Is it <laughs> Barry White? Barry White. Yeah. Uh, up, good guys? evening, good evening, everyone. <laughs> um, but no, I just wanted to ask, because um, I didn't realize you guys had lived in Atlanta, and um, I'm from Memphis originally. I was going to say that was another like birthplace of trap music, too. Yeah, where? Um, yeah. Memphis? Oh, where? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, um, real quick. We got a version of that uh, Will Smith song with a Memphis rapper like doing the hook. hook. Who is it? I don't know. I just found it on some mixtape. It's incredible. I should Word. play that before you're done. Okay. Yeah, I would actually like to hear that. But um, and so I, I was just curious, like, because you were saying y'all were in Atlanta what, in like '07, '08, kind of mm -hmm. that yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah, and I was just curious, like, what, like, what the Atlanta scene was like at that time, and how, like, because I just I moved from Memphis to LA, and so like, the whole Southern to LA change is like a really big change. So I was just wondering what the Atlanta scene was like at that time and how different like LA felt like when y'all first moved there. Atlanta was like, uh, there's a mixture of what you would call weirdo music, like they said in the Double XL magazine. Not weirdo to us, but like, this Back then was D4L and D4L, but then Laffy Taffy. Laffy Taffy, but then there was these kids named yeah. Prototype, like kind of doing the outcast music. Then there was, um, Gucci Man was just coming up with Jeezy. Uh, by that time, Young Jeezy was still doing mixtapes. Uh, there's this producer named Shorty Red that birthed that whole, uh, that trap sound really came from his production. Then you had Zaytoven. I don't think he was just bubbling around then, but it was really Shorty Red. And he was producing, Shorty Red was producing all of Jeezy stuff. So that was the sound. Um, but it felt cool. It was great energy. It was like, Okay, we were working with um, Bangladesh. 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 Yeah. yeah, we worked with him down there. His house was around the corner from ours. His sound was always weird in a good way because he would take these 808s and really, if you took the drums out, it was like a Burkheim music. It's techno, super techno, techno. Very techno, Detroit techno, but he would put trap drums on them. That's how you got the Amili record, just him messing around. But Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And Bossy. Bossy. Yeah. Um, but LA, you mean like LA when we got there in 2010? Yeah, just like was that like kind of like a stark transition, just like a weird change? Or well, I guess we came from to, New York. To we New went York, to New York, York okay, then yeah. LA. Yeah, we went, to, we went to, from Atlanta, we went to New York for like two, three years, then LA. So both coasts, uh, what was happening was this resurgence of uh, underground artists like Cuddy. So when we were doing music in New York, it was Cuddy, us, uh, Wale, Drake. Mickey Fax, J. Cole. J. Cole. Like, we knew J. Cole back then, just running to each other in the streets. But, um, yeah, it was just like new artists wanting to do something different and not depending on the, the, the older artists for the uh, cosigns. It was like, let's just do our own thing. And then when we got to the West Coast, same thing. Discovered um, Odd Future. Somebody played, yeah. the, played it for us in a hotel. We were like, that Earl kid is dope. And then we end up working with them. Um, who else was around in the West Coast? 
Ty, I think Tiger started to do his thing. Tiger, yeah. tight dollar sign. It was yeah. just a white G like mustard, tooted and, um, and booted, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting records, you know. And it was amazing to see those guys take it in their own way, you know. So we learned from that. That's how we got Big Fish, the song. We were paying attention to those guys. They has white well, mustard has such a he still has such a crazy run. We were like, if he's doing it well, why don't we just you know adopt the sound? And they worked, <laughs> so. My man with the Reeboks. Oh, y'all got the same Reeboks. Yeah. No, those are uh, nice. <laughs> Product placement, okay. Yeah. Um, nice y'all get a check for that? See, I don't know about that. Okay. <laughs> hey, they were just in the hotel room, so. No, no. no. <laughs> um, right. I just wanted to ask how much emphasis you guys put onto mixing your own beats, or if you guys have, like, specific engineers you like working with. Um, yeah. Because I know that makes a difference. I've seen sessions where, like, it's more of a jam thing into like a Pro Tools situation. They have somebody else handle the nitty gritty stuff or if you really like to get into your own mixes. Well, we mix everything before we send it to our engineer. Our main engineer is our boy Stan Green who mixed Ghost, he mixed... Um, Rihanna stuff. Yeah, he mixed a bunch Big of stuff. Sean, he's got We blacks, used to hoop together and, and but that's our guy. But we mix everything and then we send it to him just to give it that clean, make sure it's not hitting the, the red. red. Yeah. But I mean, our mixes we can just put out, but we prefer him to like do the final mixes. But Second question is, how much emphasis do you guys put into naming your beats? The beats usually Great become question. the name of the songs. That's very yeah. yeah. So we know a lot of producers, they'll name their tracks the day they made them. Like the dates. Yeah. Yeah. The dates. And we always tell them, yo, title your tracks. That energy transfer, that's how you yeah. sell it. So Crawl is the name of the beat. Uh, Cinerita the is the name of the beat. Um, what, what else? Centurion, that was the name of the beat. We called it um, Crime of the Century. No, 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 he changed it, yeah. And then he changed it to Centurion. But usually, uh, I can know when I'm not gonna sell a track. If the title is whack, I'm like, damn. Yeah, it's really the it's energy. the energy. Some for some reason, people can see the words and and get the idea of what you were thinking. So yeah, for us, it, it it's important, but maybe not so much. I don't know. For us, it is. No, I feel that. Thank you. Um, I was wondering how you deal with um, being stuck in creativity. Um, like, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of pressure, and especially in this big industry, but like everyone who's making music sometimes deal, deals with like being stuck. Oh, like writer's block? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I had that for like a few years. Movies. For yeah. Me. I watch movies. Do things you like, because then I think naturally it, it inspires the next thought, just in that, that inspired thought. But yeah, I've had writer's block for many years. I just kind of got back into it last year. <coughs> yeah. You just... And then I have my moments, too. Yeah. I, just, I don't know. I let him create stuff, and I just like piggyback, or I'll create, he piggyback. It just depends. But Or just live, live your creativity, right? So you don't have to have writer's... The writer's block would be less if you just live your creativity. You're just doing it. You're getting inspired by things, you make a mental note or maybe take a picture or whatever, do a voice note. But if you live your creativity, then it, it, it will never stop, it just keeps going. And if there is a block, then there's something else you have to kind of meditate to get that blockage out or something. But yeah, if you live your creativity, then it, it'll be less and less of a writer's block. Does that make sense? Let's thank these guys again. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.